Welcome to the Buick Outdoors Podcast. I'm your host, Sheldon Marion, and on this podcast, we dive deep into the outdoors. We discuss hunting and fishing techniques, give you tips and tricks, tell stories, and everything in between to help you enjoy the outdoors. This podcast is brought to you by Northbound Gear. Northbound Gear is designed for maneuverability and durability and is made to last through even the toughest of elements. My go-to for their pants is the Water Resistance Adventure Pants and their lined waterproof jeans. I've worn them while out ice fishing, crawling through the woods bear hunting, and on the west coast out on the boat. And I even wear them around when I'm having a lazy day at the house. They are that comfortable. They also offer jackets, summer pants, backpacks, and many more. Men's and women's sizes are available, and by partnering with One Tree Planted, you're planting a tree with every purchase. Check them out for yourself at northboundgear.co, and when you use my promo code SHELDON15 at checkout, you'll receive 15% off your order. That's northboundgear.co and promo code SHELDON15. This podcast is brought to you by Rampage Coffee. Rampage Coffee is crafted in micro batches to produce a premium quality coffee that is just not possible any other way. Step up your coffee game and get amped with premium quality freshly roasted coffee. Right now I'm waiting on the sampler bundle where you get to try all four blends for around $20. It comes with a full force premium espresso, code black dark roast, riot medium roast, the C4 extreme caffeine blend, and it also comes with some pretty cool looking stickers. If you head over to rampagecoffee.com and use our promo code Buick, you'll receive 10% off. That's rampagecoffee.com, promo code B-U-I-C-K to get 10% off and get amped with Rampage Coffee. Well, welcome back to another Buick Outdoors podcast. You know, everybody likes a, a real good fishing story, and today I got uh, got a few of them for you. A uh, couple of years back, we took my Auntie Kim out fishing down the Portland Canal, and uh, on this particular day, we went out and did some halibut fishing. And, uh, you know, with Kim, she grew up hunting and fishing with the rest of the family and all that, but she doesn't have overly too much experience on the ocean. So, uh, you know, when it comes to halibut, she didn't really want to catch like a real big one kind of a thing. So we had to hook into a couple of them, real men, kind of get our limit. And then we finally uh, hooked into uh, a bit of a smaller one. And just before we did that, we were, we were jigging and a, a pot of porpoises came in. And a porpoise, they're, they're about the size of a dolphin kind of a thing, but they're part of the whale family. And they kind of swim around the boat and they kind of jump up and stuff. They put on a little bit of a show, but they eventually kind of started to take off. So once they took off, we went back to fishing kind of a deal. And uh, I was jigging away and then I felt the halibut come up and he kind of grabbed the herring and I let him kind of chew and suck on it a little bit there and then you can feel him kind of tug a little bit and then they kind of swallow the hook and once they do that I reef up on her and set the hook and right away when you catch a small one you can tell it's just kind of it's almost like dead weight that you're bringing up when you catch a big one they really start to tug on the line quite a bit and they really want to get back down to the bottom of the ocean floor again so right away, I, I knew it was a, a small one. So I set the hook, tightened her up a little bit, and here you go, Kim. You know, it's, it's a little one, so don't worry about it. It's not that bad. And so she was sitting there, and she started cranking it up. And then uh, on the fish finder there, we're in about 400 feet of water at this spot. And when you're reeling up a halibut, you can kind of see little tracks coming up. But then we could also see that the porpoises kind of came back. And you could see them, they were kind of diving down to like 50 to 100 feet kind of a thing. So we didn't really pay much attention. You know, we're in 400 feet of water, shouldn't be that big of a deal. And so, you know, we went on about our thing, you know, just letting letting Kim reel in the fish and fight the fish. And she's bringing it up and her arms are getting kind of tired. And we look over and, yeah, you're about 350 feet. So she keeps going and the little track line, it, you can see it slowly coming up. She gets to about about 300 feet. Then all of a sudden you see these little tracks. They're about 250 feet or so. And then all of a sudden she goes, Hey, I thought you said you gave me a little one. And we look over and what happened was 
a porpoise end up diving down to about 300 feet, grab that halibut, and started to take off with it. And when I say it took off with it, uh, it <laughs> it went quick. Yeah, it grabbed that fish, and when it started to swim away, that reel just started, like, just spooling line like crazy now normally when you catch like a big halibut you know when they pull and tug and you're fighting you know when the line starts to spool out it'll kind of go zzz, 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 and stop and they can reel it up a little bit and once in a while they'll put in a, a pretty good run but it's just kind of like a constant pull it's just zzz, 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 right and they just kind of go back down well this porpoise when it grabbed that halibut it grabbed it and when it took off, that reel didn't go zzz, zzz. It went zzz, just like a high-pitched squeal. And, like, <laughs> we looked over, and she goes, you said it was a little one. And she's just screaming because that line was just going, like, mock one out of the reel. And that porpoise was swimming away so fast with that halibut, you could smell the bearings in the reel itself getting hot. Like, it smelt like hot metal on metal kind of thing and uh that oh man it was going so fast the only thing i thought we could do is just cut the line so i grabbed a knife and i reached over and you didn't have to saw it or anything like that i just reached over and just barely touched that line and as soon as you touched that line it went bunk. <laughs> and man that thing it cut so fast then we started looking at the fish finder and you can you can actually see the tracks where the porpoise just started to dive down and it just went straight down to about 300 feet there grab that and then all those tracks and marks on the fish finder just disappeared so we knew exactly what happened and there's been lots of times with uh not so much porpoises but seals when you have a, a salmon on they've grabbed a hold of a salmon before and there's times you get them up to the boat and you have like half a fish or they just grab the fish and you have like a set of lips on the hook kind of thing but yeah this time here that was uh that was something else that that was the first and only time that's ever happened to us and man yeah yeah that was that was quite the experience <laughs> it was just funny as hell though seeing uh seeing old auntie kim kind of yelling at us getting mad because we told her it was a little one and at the time it was and then uh turns out you know, she caught a porpoise, kind of. <laughs> yeah, another story about the Portland Canal. We took our buddy Ryan uh, down there with us the one time, and uh, there's some cabins that you can you can kind of rent. Uh, for us, when we went there, we were at like the end of like the busy season or whatever. We went in September when uh, the kind of tourism and stuff at all dies down and you kind of get into like the rainy wet season and uh so the place is pretty well empty and it's, it's right along the portland canal there's a main cabin and then i don't know maybe six guest cabins or something like that and then like a couple of shower houses and bathrooms and stuff and everything runs on uh on the generator so what we would do is we'd go out we'd fish all day then at the end of the day, we'd come back and uh, we brought our small deep freeze with us and our little Honda generator. So every evening we'd go out, fire up our small generator, run the run the deep freeze for you know a couple of hours, make sure it's good and solid and cold, and then that's where we stored all of our fish and stuff like that that we were catching. And then uh, you'd shut that off, come up, make supper or whatever, and. Then at the end of the night, you know, we'd be sitting around drinking some Caesars or whatever. And, and then eventually when it was time for bed, you'd go up to the main generator and you'd shut that off and then go to bed. Uh, but down there, pretty well the Portland Canal, you're between basically two mountains. And the canal is actually really, really skinny. You got U.S. on one side and Canada on the other side. And then also you have the whole canopy of just like the West Coast trees, you know, and it's extremely thick. It doesn't let any light in there whatsoever. And at night, like when all the lights are off and everything, like it's, it's dark. You like, you might've 
seen kind of uh, a dark night before, but it's down there. It is a different kind of dark because it doesn't let any lights in whatsoever. And there's also no lights to be let in, really. Uh, you have the stars and that's about it. But our buddy Ryan, the guest cabin that we were in, it just had two beds in there. Ryan was on one, dad was on the other, and then I was just sleeping on the floor. And we're all laying there and we're getting ready for bed. And you hear Ryan go, man, it's dark. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's pretty dark around here. He goes, no, 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 like, like it's really, really dark. Like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's what happens, you know, we're on the coast, we're between two mountain ranges, you can't even really see much of the stars, it might have been cloudy that night or something, and then, you know, there's no city streets or lights or like that for about 30 miles kind of a thing, he goes, no, no, man, like, my hand is in front of my face, and like, I'm touching my nose, and I can't see my fingers, like, like it is fucking dark, <laughs> <laughs> and me and dad we just started teasing him I said well geez I, I didn't think you needed a nightlight there Ryan like are you gonna be okay are you gonna manage and he goes I, I, hey I'll be fine but <laughs> uh, it was it was kind of funny and you know places like that like I understand like if he's a a bit of a city guy there and uh you know, if you've never had, like, a, an actual complete blacked out dark night kind of a thing, like, it can be a bit spooky. And then, uh, also down there, there's so many bears, so we had to bring one of our rifles with us. And, man, just going up and turning off the generator, you pack the gun and a flashlight with you because there's big bears and there's big grizzlies. And it wasn't too far away, maybe, I don't know. 50 yards or so you just walked up the one platform hung a left and it was on the side of the main cabin there and like you know so him and dad they had packed the gun they turn off the generator and then like when we shut off the generator you know it was pitch black dark so you definitely needed a flashlight because like your eyes can't even adjust to kind of see a little bit because like the full canopy above you it like it's it's black black so they would pack the rifle, and the one time it was my turn to go and shut off the generator, so I just walked up with the flashlight, and walked up there, turned off the generator, flicked on the flashlight, came back, and Ryan, again, poor guy, he's, I think he's pretty scared of bears, but uh, yeah, he was kind of panicky. Oh, man, you can't be going over there without a gun. Like, oh, what if one of these grizzly bears comes and gets you? I said, ah, no self-respecting bear will take a bite out of me. <laughs> There was another time that me and Dad uh, went out. Uh, that was Portland Canal as well. And uh, we end up sleeping the night uh, just in the boat on one of the government docks. Uh, I talked, uh, maybe it was last podcast, about the floating docks that used to be around there. And now they still have some of those docks, but they're uh, the government docks. So they're a nice steel dock that's kind of connected to the shore or whatever. And then there's a bit of a ramp that comes down. And then there's the platform that you can actually park on. And uh, they have a bit of a of a wave break. And basically it's just great big huge cedar logs that are kind of chained, chained up together and then anchored into place. So you're able to bring your boat in, come between the docks and these big cedars, and then tie your boat up to the dock. And then that way if there's any waves and stuff like that, the, the trees, they kind of take the brunt of the waves. And then it should be just like a ripple that kind of comes in there. So anyways, me and dad, we tied up the boat. And we had our supper and all that stuff. And we were getting ready for bed. And then the the wind started to pick up a little bit. But then the seas really started to come up. I don't know if it was a bit of a full moon that day or what. But uh, uh, once that tide started to kind of rip in there and the waves were coming in. The waves, they were kind of... I don't know how to describe it other than they were... They were short, like they weren't very tall, but they were long. So and what was happening was these long waves would come in, they'd hit those logs, and then it would kind of create like a ripple effect. And every once in a while between those waves, you'd have one good one that would come in. 
And when you tie up a boat to a dock, you don't tie it right tight. Uh, you always leave some slack in the rope. That way your boat has a chance to kind of move and go with the water. And it's not constantly like slamming up against the side of the dock. So we did that. You know, we tied up the boat, you know, what you call normally. And uh, the problem that we were having is you get a little wave that would come in, but they were long. So like it would come in and it would kind of pull your boat back kind of thing away from the dock. And then it would push you back in. So every once in a while, you know, you'd be laying in the, in the boat and it would just kind of go bunk, bunk, bunk. But then every once in a while, one of those waves in between the waves, it, I don't know what it was. It was just like a, a real short but tall one and it would come in and it would grab the boat and it would almost pick it up and put it on the dock and it would just slam you in and with the boat there we had just the drop down kind of plasticky canvas on the back and they all just rivet and like they snap into place kind of a thing and then with dad's old boat the two seats in the back they folded down into a bed so dad was sleeping on that and I was just sleeping on the floor again. <laughs> I, I sleep on the floor quite a bit during our fishing trips. But anyways, we were laying there. And uh, every time we'd have, like, you get, like, the constant rocking motion. So it was pretty hard to even try to get some sleep. But then when one of those taller waves would come in and it would just slam you against that dock. Man, it was just brutal because you'd be laying there. And for me... It was hard for me because, I mean, like, I was on the floor. So, like, whatever. I had room to kind of roll kind of a thing. But for Dad, he thought he was getting the good end of the stick here because he was up on a nice cushiony sort of kind of bed. So he thought he was going to have a comfortable sleep. But those things, they're only uh, maybe 24 inches wide, maybe 36. But with the, with those waves... Every time it would roll and slam into the side of the dock, it would almost buck him out of the bed. And then when he would lean over to kind of compensate for the wave, it would hit. And then it would bounce you back the other way. So and he was already kind of leaning that way. So when that happened, he would almost completely roll off that bed. So he was, he was up pretty well all night long just trying to stay on the bed. And then I was up all night long just because you just couldn't sleep, just constantly getting rolled all night. And then, like, you know, we've slept on the boat quite a bit where when the waves are kind of coming in, it almost just kind of, like, rocks you to sleep kind of a deal. Where on that trip, there was no, uh, there's no getting rocked to sleep. It was more or less just jarring you awake, but constantly, so... Yeah, you, uh, we didn't get too much sleep there. <laughs> but during the day, you know, it was beautiful weather. We had a great fishing trip. It was just that one night that was just absolutely brutal. And then uh, with that canvas thing, too, when you snap it all into place, like, it's not, it's not really, like, airtight kind of a deal. So I think it rained the one day, and I woke up a little bit wet. But other than that, uh, yeah, the waves were... Uh, we're about the only downfall to that. And then also uh, when you're out fishing and stuff and you you kind of get wet during the day and then at night you kind of take off your wet clothes, put on some dry stuff, and then you kind of hope that your stuff dries up. But uh, for us, we didn't exactly get that. When you woke up the next day and you put your clothes back on, it was, uh, uh, it was pretty well. You put on clothes that weren't quite as wet as when you took them off kind of a thing. And then I... I want to say that was during a September trip there as well, too, because September, the fishing is great, but the weather is crap, and you pretty well, you're just covered in rain and kind of just wet air the whole time you're there. So as long as you don't mind suffering a little bit, you can catch some some really nice fish, and, and a lot of them, too. Like It was phenomenal fishing. Uh, the wetness, though, you kind of got to get used to it or get over it. And for us, we just kind of got over it, you know, and went back to fishing. <laughs> On one of my last trips to uh, Prince Rupert, there's one little spot that we like to go and set our prawn traps at. And uh, it's a nice little kind of hidden away little inlet kind of a thing. And uh, we've 
we've caught prawns there quite a bit. Uh, you know, the commercial guys go in there from time to time. And usually once they kind of go through there, the prawns are pretty well done. But uh, on this trip, we were kind of right in the middle. Like some guys were kind of coming in as we were coming in kind of a deal. So there was some competition, but it wasn't overly too bad. Uh, but the one day we went out and we pulled our prawn, one set of prawn traps and we had a few in there and no big deal. And we go to grab our next set of prawn traps. And as soon as I pulled the slack out of the line, the prawn puller, instead of it just running at a constant speed and just going boom, 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 as you're just kind of slowly pulling your line in, it all of a sudden just went and stopped. And normally, like, we've had that happen a few times before. And typically what that is, is it's just your prawn trap. It's just kind of stuck on the bottom or it's hung up on a rock or something like that. And, you know, the majority of the time, if you just give your line an extra wrap on the prawn puller, turn it back on and just kind of give her an extra tug kind of a thing, uh, it usually pops free. If not, we've had it where we've taken our line put it around one of the uh the stern cleats and gave it a pull like with the boat and we've popped them off and then uh and then that way you know just kind of dislodge the rock or whatever it was that it was stuck on because you know the current underneath even though you're in a few hundred feet of water you know the the water is still moving so when you set your prawn traps they don't just go down nice and slow and lay flat you know when you're setting them they can drift a little bit and then once they hit the bottom you know we run chains uh on our prawn traps just to hold them in place as good as we can but uh unfortunately on this trip or in this day i guess i should say uh they well they either drifted or they landed right on top of what we had to pull in because we end up putting the the rope onto one of the stern cleats and we gave her a pull, and it popped loose. So we grabbed the line, put it back onto the prawn puller, and I started going. And again, like that poor prawn puller was just working. Instead of it doing that little, it like the entire time, I was just two hand pulling, stop, grab it again, pull, and I was just moving it like a foot at a time, maybe two feet. And that's not too bad, but when you're in, uh, what is it, three to 400 feet of water, I think that one particular spot is, it takes a very long time to do that. And we also had all the extra weight of whatever it was that our prawn trap was uh, hooked to. And we knew it was hooked onto something, because normally if it's stuck on the bottom, as soon as it breaks free, then it just, whoop, you know, it just comes up. But with this, it was just a constant struggle the entire time. And when we got to the top of the surface, I could see a prawn trap. But it wasn't our prawn trap. I went, oh, there's our trap. And I looked, oh, that's not our trap. So we stopped. I took the slack, tied it around one of the, the cleats there. We loosened it off. And we started hand, hand pulling the line just off the side without the prawn puller on. And what it was is there was a commercial guy that went out there who knows how long ago. Could have been a couple of years, could have been 15 years ago. Who knows? But his prawn traps got caught on something on the bottom. And when he tried to pull it up, his line snapped and all of his traps were still down there. And that's what our traps ended up getting snagged into. And my God, was it a mess. He had, well, with commercial guys, I don't know how many they run. Say it's 12, and it's all just 12 on one string. And we brought up, I want to say it was four or five prawn traps, and they're all just rusted out. But the first set, there was two of them that were all just, uh, just a big rat's nest. And it wasn't even on our prawn trap. It was like wrapped up in our line kind of a thing. So we pulled it up, grabbed all the loose tension or loose line, 
tie that up to one of the cleats. And then I reached over with my knife and I was just cutting old line away and grabbing the trap and trying to untangle it so we could get our trap. And eventually we pulled two of his off of our line, started up the prawn puller again, pulled up until we got to our first one, unhooked that, and the thing was still working like crazy. Like you could smell like the motor and the gears and stuff was getting hot. And uh, eventually we got up to our second trap because we run two on one line. And then that one, it was the same thing. Just a big rat's nest of just junk and garbage. And, oh, man. And, like, there were so many, like, little barnacles growing on it. And, like, slimy junk. Like, oh, it was just, it was just gross. And, like, when I go fishing, too, I don't wear gloves or anything like that. So I'm just in there, bare skin and all, just pulling this crap off of there. And I think we end up eventually getting, like, I don't know, maybe a dozen prawns. And out of that dozen, I think there was probably six or seven that actually came out of the other guy's prawn trap. But I think that was just the prawns were just kind of scurrying around and and uh, kind of just got kind of caught up in the commotion there as they got pulled up. But, uh, yeah, we were there for quite a while, too, uh, dealing with that mess. And I want to say we end up bringing those prawn traps back into town and I, I think we just put them on the dock and went like, I don't know what to do with these like they're not in the ocean anymore so good on us I guess for cleaning up the place but uh yeah those things they're just a nasty rust bucket oh man it was gross and I think I have an actual video of that somewhere and uh maybe I if I can find it maybe I'll edit something together and and throw it up here for you guys because Oh, man, it was just a complete and utter mess. And needless to say, after that, we didn't set our, our prawn traps back there. We went we went down the line a little, a little ways, plus all the other commercial guys that are starting to move in there. So it was time to get out of there anyways, and that just uh, kind of made us, made, us, made us move a little bit quicker. <laughs> then speaking about prawns, one thing that we kind of do I don't know if dad wants me to tell this story or not, but uh, if you guys are ever out halibut fishing and you're prawning at the same time, I highly suggest that you go out and you check your prawn traps first and then don't clean them until you're halibut fishing because there's been a lot of times, you know, if we have a boatload of people, you can only really fish two, sometimes three people. And if there's, you know, four or five of us or whatever, you know, you end up kind of, not necessarily getting bored, but you're looking for something to do. You know what I mean? So a lot of times we'll pull our prawn traps. Uh, we'll grab our bucket of prawns or whatever. Then we'll head over and we anchor up for halibut. And uh, pretty well whoever's not fishing, they'll sit there and they'll either BS in the cab or whatever. Or if you're looking for a job to do, uh, we clean the prawns while we're there. And for the prawns, you basically just grab them by the base of their tail Right where it kind of connects to the head, there's uh, the head there. It almost has like a little shield on it. And you just kind of grab the the shield, whatever you want to call it. It's almost like a gill plate. And then grab just behind that on the tail. And you pretty well just twist and pull. And when you do that, the head pops off and you have your tail. And what we do is we take all the heads and we'll put them in a bucket. And we'll take our tails and, of course, put those in a separate bucket because we're taking those home. We're going to be eating those. And uh, pretty well, once as you're done, we take that bucket. And as we're fishing for halibut, we just dump the bucket right into the water. And there's been so many times where we'll be fishing away. Say we've caught one or two halibut or whatever. we got a couple more to catch. The next one or the second one that we catch you bring him up, and as he's coming up, you're just starting to see the color of that halibut. And he kind of starts to puke a little bit. And you'll see all these prawn heads start to come out of him. So, like, those prawn heads, they must sink extremely quick, especially when you're fishing a couple hundred feet of water. And they must give out, like, a scent trail or something. Because, like, the amount of halibut that we've caught that have spit up just bucket loads 
of uh, prawn heads as you're bringing it up to the boat. Like, it's one of those little fishing secrets that I might have just revealed. If I did, well, good job. You you might catch some more halibut, but uh, <laughs> but man, it's uh it's a sight to see when you see a halibut coming up and you see your your little halibut rig, see your T bar weight. You might see a, a hook hanging out. You only go on by one hook. And then all of a sudden you just see all these prawn heads just just flowing out of its mouth. And uh, it's quite the sight to see. Another thing that caught us by surprise the one time. Uh, when I was talking about uh, fishing in uh, Port Renfrew. It was uh, John with Jolly Rogers Fishing Adventures. And one of the things that we hooked into there was uh, was quite the ordeal. We were out halibut fishing on one of the calmer days, not the uh, not the day with the big rough water, and uh, we hooked into what we thought was like a three hundred pound halibut, and man, you know it was just doing the same thing. You bounce it off the bottom a couple of times, bring it up a couple of feet or whatever, and then go down, bounce it a couple more times, and when you hit the rod, just bent right over and went. Zzz, 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 zzz. And then stopped, and we're like, oh, geez, that was a big one. And you just, like, reef up on it, and he wouldn't budge. And finally, we kind of broke the suction, and we slowly started to, to reel him in. But, man, that thing, it just fought like crazy. And there was me, Blaine, and Dad, and Karen. But this thing, it was so big and pulling so hard that I, I want to say Karen didn't even hold on to the rod because like it was just pulling like crazy so then me blaine and dad we would take turns reeling this sucker in and i think we were kind of doing like 30 minute intervals kind of a thing you know i'd fight for 30 minutes hand it off to blaine blaine would run the rod for about 30 minutes he'd hand it off to dad and we did that for like two hours or something like that and in the meantime, John, he was in behind us, and he was getting his harpoon ready because there's absolutely no way whatsoever that you can bring in a big halibut like that onto uh, pretty well the deck of, like, a small boat kind of a thing. Like, if you have a really, really big, like, an actual, like, commercial fishing boat, you can. But, uh, yeah, when you're in, like, a 28 or 30-foot kingfisher, uh, that back deck, it's big for fishing boat, but uh, it's pretty small for 300-pound halibut. So you end up harpooning it and pretty well you grab a harpoon that's connected to a cable and that harpoon, it goes onto a harpoon stick and then that cable goes and it's connected to a line. That line's connected to a big buoy and what you end up doing is when you harpoon the halibut, it goes through the, through the meat, comes out the other end and then when you pull the, the harpoon stick out, the uh, the spear itself or the tip, whatever, it stays in. And where the cable is, it's kind of right in the middle of the spear. So when you pull it out, it turns and it, it lays flat on its belly. And then that way, when the fish takes off, the harpoon is through them and it's sideways so it can't pull out. And then with the buoy attached to it, they end up swimming down, but then the buoy just kind of pulls them back up. So once you harpoon it, they swim down, and you wait for your big orange buoy to come back up. And then they swim down again, you wait for your buoy to come up, and you just kind of let them tire themselves out. And then eventually you're able to grab your buoy, pull them in. You have another line ready for a tail wrap, and pretty well you just lasso its tail and then tie them to the boat kind of a thing. So he is sitting there, and he's ready for this, what we thought was a monstrous halibut to come up. And right as it was just starting to get to the surface, that sucker took one more deep dive down, and we had to reel him back in for like another 30 minutes, 45 minutes. And then he started to come up again, and John, he was sitting there ready like Zeus with the trident kind of a thing, and he went, oh, no, skate, can't. <laughs> so what we ended up hooking into was just a, a monster skate. If you don't know what a skate is, it's just like a kind of like a stingray kind of a thing. And, uh, man, I think I said something along the lines of, <laughs> can we eat them anyways? Because <laughs> we were fighting that fish for just hours and hours. And it was really cool to see, especially, like, the size of those skates and the way that they're 
their fins are and stuff. Like, a big halibut is hard to reel in. Uh, you know, they come up like a sheet of plywood and a big skate. In my mind, was even harder because, like, uh, the way that their body is just slightly different. And I, I don't know, but it was much, much harder than the big halibut that I caught. But, man, like, what an experience that was to hook into a big skate, reel them up, have them run off so many times, and then... Unfortunately, you get them up to the side of the boat and realize it's not halibut, but it was it was still a really cool experience anyways. And then talking about a big halibut, uh, in Prince Rupert, uh, we were halibut fishing, and we caught, I don't know, whatever, one or two halibut kind of things, you know, like the 20, 30 pounders kind of size. Then I was sitting there, and when you're jigging, you can feel when the weight kind of hits the bottom and every once in a while there's some rocks and stuff where you'll feel it kind of bounce and then weirdly kind of bounce again or it kind of goes dunk and then kind of dunk because it just kind of hits a pile of gravel or something like that and then slides off and a lot of times if you're feeling that you're not really going to be catching much for halibut because they like flat sandy bottoms so I kept feeling that and went ah man I think we're we're in rocks, but looking at the the fish finder and the topography maps and stuff, it was like I don't think we're in rocky ground here. So that I don't know what's going on, whatever. Maybe there's somebody's old trap or something down there. And so I kept going, and all of a sudden I went and I jigged her a couple more times, felt that weird little dunk, and then I went to jig it again, and my rod just did a just like a 90 to, or a 180 kind of a thing. It just went, oh no. Like I am just like, I'm stuck, stuck on the bottom. So then I was reeling the tip all the way down to the, to the water kind of thing. So my rod was bent pretty well right over. And I would just pull as hard as I could. And went, oh no. My dad, I think I'm stuck on the bottom here. And I'm going to, I'm pulling, I'm pulling pretty hard. And uh, I might have to cut the line here. And then all of a sudden it just, the the rod just slowly started to rise up. And I went, oh, maybe I'm not stuck on the bottom. And I reeled it up and went, hmm, well, whatever. Send it back down. And pretty soon it was doing the same thing. I'd be jigging and you could feel it going, tap, nothing. And when you pull up. When you hit it real hard on the bottom, you can feel it actually sink into like the sand and the mud. Because when you go to jig it again, you kind of have to break the suction. So it kind of goes, you know. And it just kept, it felt weird. I said, I don't know. I think there's something messing with my hook down there or something. Because I'd go down and it would, you'd feel it sink into the mud, pull it up, sink it into the mud. And then I'd pick it up like maybe six inches and then i'd slowly lower it back down just bring it up and then just like it took me like whatever one one inch per second and i put it back down and then all of a sudden it'll go dunk, dunk. i went wow that's kind of that's not right because we're not moving it's at slack tide so the water ain't moving and then all of a sudden i went to pull it back up and again my rod just started to slowly bend and I went, you know, I think this is a fish. And Dad said, no, there's no way that's a fish. You know, you're just you're psyching yourself up, whatever. You know, you you got to, you know, you're stuck on the bottom. So I said, well, here, you you tried pulling off. So he grabbed me, he did the same thing. Reeled it down to the tip of the, the rod was pretty well in the water and just reefed up on it. He goes, no, nah, you're stuck. He hands the rod back to me and said, well all right, I'm going to pull until I break the rod or I break the line. And he goes, well, you can just cut it. I said, nope, because I think there's a fish here. So I put her all the way down. I put my legs up against the side of the boat, and I gave her the Sheldon Marion special pull. I just reefed on it. Pretty soon, it went poof, and it came up, and it just went zzzz right back down and said ha see 
I knew this was a fish. And dad went, no, you're crazy talk. That's not a fish. You're stuck on the bottom. Quit playing games. Bring it up already. I said, well, I'll be a while bringing this up. So again, I reeled right back down to the bottom and I just started reefing up on her. And pretty soon I could sit there and holding tension on it. And then when you're reeling in halibut, you hold tension. And then as you're reeling, you slowly bring your rod back down. So that way you're keeping tension on the line, but then you're also gaining on it. Slowly started to pick it back up. And I kept doing that a few times. I said, no, no, there's a fish on here. And then all of a sudden I got uh, maybe like 20 feet from the bottom, like off the bottom. And that thing just went right back down. I said, oh yeah, this is a big one. And surprisingly, I just, you know, you just keep keeping attention on the line and you just reel it down, slowly pull it up. And in about 45 minutes of like hard, tough pulling, like it was not easy whatsoever. We bring it back up and dad looks over and goes, holy shit, that is a fish. And we, <laughs> there was no no chance that we were keeping that one because this is after they changed the regulations for halibut where i think you can't keep anything over 120 centimeters and uh we have it marked on one of our paddles i think and we took the paddle and we reached over the boat and we put it on that fish and the tip of the paddle was on its nose and the handle of the paddle was a boat halfway three quarters of the way down this fish and the whole back deck of his boat from the transom to the cab is about the length of that halibut and so what we ended up doing was it was all tuckered out and he was just kind of sitting there kind of floating and we just reached over with the knife after we put the paddle on him just to see how long the sucker was just because we were curious like we knew we couldn't keep it but we just wanted to see if it was longer than the paddle and he dwarfed a full-size paddle so we just reached over with the knife cut the line and said see you later and uh department of oceans and fisheries uh they have like a graph uh that you can kind of reference to for roughly knowing the size of a halibut and i can't remember how long it actually was because we do have a tape measure on the boat and we kind of took a real rough because we just wanted to get that fish back down to the bottom but we took a rough measurement and then also when it was beside the boat you can look like the nose was at the transom the tail was pretty well inside the cab kind of a thing so we yeah you know a rough number it's all a rough estimate anyways with their charts and then looking at the charts that halibut was between 300 and 350 pounds i believe and Man, that was just a monstrous fish. And that halibut, you know, it only took me like 45 minutes to get up to the boat. Like, it was a workout, and I was pulling on her pretty good. But compared to, like, that big skate, it was nothing. He made, like, maybe two or three runs to try to get back down to the bottom. And then with those big fish, too, I really think the bigger that they are, the faster they kind of tire themselves out. So after... You know, they get a couple of really good runs in, but then that's kind of all that they have. You know, they're like a big heavyweight kind of a thing. You watch a heavyweight fighter or whatever, and after about round two, the fight slows down a lot. It's the same thing with those big halibut, well, for that one anyways. So, uh, yeah, that was that was pretty cool. We got somewhat of a picture of it. Like, we did take a picture of it, but, uh, you know, there was me... And dad on the side of the boat dealing with this fish. And then I believe it was Karen. She just kind of reached over and kind of quickly snapped a picture. So you can see the fish. But there's nothing nothing to kind of graph or scale its size with. So you can see the fish. But you can't see a, a paddle. You can't even see like the edge of the boat. Because she just reached over and snapped a picture kind of a thing. But uh, man, that uh, yeah, that's the... I don't know if that would be the biggest fish or second biggest. It's hard to tell because we didn't really know how big that skate was again. 
rough estimate, it was around 300 pounds. Same with my halibut, it was around that three to 350 mark. And that's because it was just a rough estimate tape measure, kind of going off of like the back of the boat. And then also the DFO's charts are also pretty rough uh, estimates there too. But, uh, you know, the biggest salmon I ever caught, that joker was right around 50 pounds. And, you know, that was another, like, real quick fight. Uh, we were just trolling just regular old, uh, I want to say anchovy teasers. And we were catching coho and chinook in a little mixed bag. And then all of a sudden we hooked into one. He made one good run. I grabbed the rod and I started reeling it in. And this was before we had a boat. Uh, I can't remember the the guy's name down in Prince Rupert there. But we had a couple of boats that just kept kind of circling us as we were trolling. And that happens a lot to the guides down there. Because, I mean, a guide is a guide. If you're not catching fish, you're not going to be getting clients. If you don't get clients, you're going to go out of business extremely fast. So some of the, I would say some of the, I don't know, shitty fishermen will kind of clue in like, hey, that's a guide boat. He knows where the fish are. So what they end up doing is they circle you a few times and then on their their GPS, you know, you see where the circle is. They take a little track and they go, boop, and they put a little GPS marker on there and then they call that, you know, finding the fish kind of a thing. Instead of just fishing and finding them that way, you know, they cheat a lot. And it's kind of a, uh, not the best way of doing it, but some guys do it. But we had guys circling us. So when we hooked on to that big one, I just started to reel like crazy. And he actually kind of helped with that fish because he was coming in so close. Like, I'm pretty sure what he was doing, he was trying to cut our, our line with his uh, prop kind of a deal. But all that did was scare the fish. And that fish, when it was spooked, it was swimming away from him. Unfortunately for the fish, it was swimming towards us. So it was just like, oh, fish on. Holy crap. This is a big one. And I just started pretty well reeling as fast as I could. And the guide grabbed the net. The fish swam up. I said, the fish is here. He was okay. And he just put the net in front of that fish, and that fish swam into the net. And then it took uh, two or three of us to bring that fish on because we didn't want to just grab the side of the net and reef it over because that fish was so big. If you do that, there's a good chance you can actually rip the bottom of your net out. So once that fish was in the net, we kept the fish in the water, and we all kind of reached over, and we just kind of grabbed handfuls of net kind of around the fish that way it kind of disperses the weight to the fish out you know throughout the net and then we all gave her a one two three picked it up got into the boat and that one i got pictures of it so i'll uh i'll look through my little albums here and i'll see if i can uh find them <clears throat> and i'll put those pictures up because when i was holding on to that fish i had my hand through its gills and the tip of his nose was pretty well level with my chin and his tail was down almost touching the ground and he was just as deep as i am wide and like i'm almost 24 inches wide like my shoulders are like 19 20 inches kind of thing and that fish was just as wide as me and then there's also pictures of the fish in a marine cooler and if you don't know the the size of a marine cooler those things are massive. They're like four feet long. Oh, I don't know, 18, 20 inches wide. And then about the same 18, 20 inches deep. And that fish was so big, it went into that cooler and the head was propped up on one side. His belly and, and uh, body was in the marine cooler and his tail was coming up the other side and we couldn't close the lid. Like it was just a huge fish. And that one, I'll have to check maybe Facebook or something like that. I know I got a picture of that around here somewhere. So I'll definitely put that up here so you guys can see just the size of that salmon. And it was just an absolute monster. Well, the last story I'll tell you about here today, because we're kind of running out of time here. Uh, 
when we went out fishing to Kluwa Lakes, we uh, we never brought in our like ice fishing rods because it was such a long trip in there. You know, it's about 22 miles, I think, from the truck. And then while you're there, you know, you bring everything in there with you, all your drinking water, your food, you know, you got all your gear, your clothes, your ice auger. Uh, these days, if you have an ice fishing tent, it's like you have a lot of stuff and like the less stuff that you bring in there is the better because like, the trail going in, it's not a groomed trail. It's not nice, smooth sailing, you know, things get beat up and broken and we've had, uh, you know, even just we we don't get into a rush going in there. We drive nice and slow and even doing that, you know, we've had sleighs break we've had hitches break pins break uh we've had times where people are bringing in cases of beer and pop and water and those have just completely obliterated we've had not a single egg make it in there like it, it's rough so when you the less stuff that you can bring into clue lakes is always better in my opinion so when we go there we don't bring any fishing rods with us. We we bring a handsaw and then just like, I don't know, it kind of looks like uh, butcher twine and it's like that black ice fishing line. I think it has like a 60 pound test or something like that. It's kind of just braided line looking stuff. But we, what we end up doing is we cut down uh, like either a willow or an alder. It's kind of whatever inch and a half two inches wide kind of a deal and like three feet long and we tie our line up in the middle and then however much line you need you string it all out and wrap it up around your stick and then you tie on just a great big massive five of diamonds or something like that so that you can use to jig with and uh i i don't even remember who it was but they were jigging for for one of the pike there and what he was doing is he was kind of sitting on his knees on the ice and he was almost doing like arm curls with it. You know, normally if you're sitting there, you're just kind of, you know, one handed and you're just kind of doing your thing. But he was kind of like arm curls kind of a thing. And then all of a sudden he felt a little, little tug, you know, not much. So he's like, ah, oh, well, that's not going to be much of a big one. And right when he started to pick up a little bit, his, his hands were maybe a foot off the ground that it was either that fish got extremely excited over something and took a run or another big one came and swooped in and grabbed the first fish and just went to pull and what ended up happening was his hands because he was still holding on to the stick when that fish grabbed it it just slammed his hands against the ice <laughs> and it, it like it was pulling so hard it like pinned his hands underneath the stick and onto the ice and he couldn't get his hands out there for a couple of seconds and he picked it up let go of the stick or whatever and it buggered his knuckles right up like his knuckles on both sides they're all beaten up and black and blue and <laughs> i don't even remember if the uh if they caught the fish or what but to be honest with you i don't even I don't even know if I was there for that trip or if that was just a story that dad told me and it was one of our uncles. But all I remember is one of them hooked into a great big monster fish and it just slammed his fingers against the ice there and it kind of had him pinned for a few seconds. <laughs> but, uh, you know, that, that's the good old clue of lakes. You know, our, our family's been going in there for, oh, decades, you know, grandpa and dad they were uh they built the original floor that's in the original cabin and the uh the table that's in there uh i think they built the bunk beds as well uh my cousin wade he built the wood stove that's in there uh it was wade uh which kid was that? i think it was jason dad and me we drove that uh big uh wood stove into the lake there because the old old stove there's a bunch of holes in it and some of the the piping was all kind of burnt out and stuff and like it was just a matter of time before there's a massive fire and in fact if you look at the roof somebody did have a fire there and somehow didn't burn the cabin down 
So when we loaded up that uh, that new stove and hauled it in there, we also hauled in some stove pipe, and we uh, we got it all changed out. And then I think it was the trip before that, Wade was in there with, I want to say it was maybe Bobby. Yeah, I think it was our cousin Bobby there. And there was a bunch of holes and stuff on some of the logs. So they had like the spray foam in a can. They filled in all the cracks and stuff. And then uh, a couple winters ago, after we lost my grandpa, we actually took some of his ashes up there and spread them at the lake. So, uh, yeah, it's a pretty special place to us and our family. And, uh, yeah, if you guys ever have the chance to check out Clue Lakes, you know, it's uh, it's uh, just a beautiful lake that's tucked away in the hills there and uh there's some pretty good fishing the fishing isn't isn't nearly as good as it used to be but uh you can still have a pretty good time and at least head in there talk to the old boy that owns the cabin you know rent it from him for a couple of days or a week however long you're going in there and have some respect for the place and clean up after yourself you know and uh yeah start making your own memories out there but anyways guys i think that's all the time i got here today I'm going to wrap this thing up, and then, uh, yeah, I want to thank you for watching on YouTube. Thank you for listening on all major podcast platforms. Uh, if you do enjoy this, make sure you head over to our YouTube channel and just kind of hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. Let me know how you enjoyed this, this podcast. If there's anything you guys want me to touch base on or any other stories and stuff, you know, please reach out, let me know, and I'll see what I can do. But anyways, guys, that's it for me. Catch you on the next one.